Hello everybody and welcome to this uh, Hongference session on things we wish we'd known. Uh, we are joined by three wonderful guests on this session and who will be they will be imparting their words of wisdom and experiences to you which I hope you will all find very very useful. Um, just a little bit about how we're going to run this session. Um, I will disappear into the corner um, and come back 15 minutes before the end. Please, if you have questions, use the ask a question button at the bottom um, and vote on any questions that you see in there. And when we come back at the end, um, we'll, we'll run, through those, run through those questions. Um, and also you'll see there's the donate to seven stories um, button as well. So very worthwhile cause, the Children's Book Archive. We know everyone's doing it a bit tough in these times, but if you can, please consider donating to Seven Stories to help them out. And now I will, um, without any further ado, I will hand over to Kate and Holly and Morag. And I will, first of all, we'll start off by asking them to give you a little bit of information about their journey to publication. So that's all for me now. And maybe Holly, if we'll just start with you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So nice to sort of see you all. Um, yeah, I'm Holly. Um, and my debut book came out last year in February, a month before lockdown. Uh, which wasn't the ideal time to be a debut. Um, but yeah, it's my first book. Um, it's called Demelza and the Spectre Detectors. It's a middle grade book about a young inventor called Demelza who finds out that she has supernatural powers and she can communicate with the dead. Um, and it was published by Chicken House. Um, and how did I get there? Well, I did the Golden Egg Foundation year um, and then was meant to go on and do the second year, but I went traveling and came home really, really skint. <laughs> um, and as much as I wanted to carry on, I just didn't have the cash to do it at the time. Um, but I'd already had interest from one agent who'd um, asked to read a bit of my manuscript after uh, doing a Twitter pitch. Um, so I sent it off to her um, and she request requested the full, which was super exciting. Um, so off the back of that, um, I decided just to kind of query some agents, um, to cut a long story short, got a, a really nice response. I was a bit of a jammy dodger, um, and managed to sign with my agent, Kate Shaw, um, fairly quickly. Um, and then Ch Chicken House preempted, um, three books. So one's come out and I'm in the middle of editing the second one at the moment. Um, and due to lockdown, it's going to come out a bit later than planned and it'll be out the beginning of next year hopefully i'll pass the bat on <laughs> morag do you want to go next yeah sure um hi i'm morag and i'm a picture book author and illustrator um my journey i guess i came to it from an illustration background um i did an ma in children's book illustration at cambridge school of art and when I graduated from there, I identified the Macmillan Prize, and that sort of got me started talking with Macmillan. And I managed to get an agent from the degree show there, really. Um, so I've been writing and illustrating books with two hoots who are part of Pan Macmillan. Um, and then my agent really encouraged me to do a bit of writing just straight writing as well so i've got some books um so if you some books up there that are published by simon and schuster um which are illustrated by ella oxstad and um, so i really came to it from an illustration background but discovered that writing's almost the best bit sometimes but don't tell them <laughs> um, yeah so i guess that's me um, hi, I'm Kate Mallinder, um, and I've got two books out. Um, my first one came out in 2019. It's Summer of No Regrets, so it's a summary one. 
and um, my second one came out in last year, in last June. So one was a pre-COVID and one was a in COVID, which makes quite a big difference to um, the experience of having your book out. Um, how I got published. Um, I started writing about seven or eight years ago and I've come to the process through the slush pile really. So I just wrote and wrote and sent stuff off way too early to agents and they went, nope. <laughs> and then I kind of went, oh, you have to edit it. And so I went through that sort of process and sent it out to agents and a better response. And so I signed with my agent. Um, and then we went through quite a long process of writing all sorts of things and writing all sorts of books and getting all sorts of rejections, lovely ones um, from lots of lovely publishers. And then finally, Summer of No Regrets was picked up by Firefly Press, um, which has been a really, really wonderful experience. On the whole, it's been really great. Um, obviously, the two experiences of the two books has been quite different. Um, but being published has, has been quite a... Um, I know they say roller coaster. Um, lots of people use the, 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 the technical term of roller coaster because it is quite up and down. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. because it's it's true. It's true. It really, yeah. really, really, really is. And and as we were saying before, you know, like it is a real balance of kind of you know really massive highs, and then a few uh, <laughs> moments along the way, isn't it? Yeah, so I wonder whether, should we just pick our um, favourite moment or the thing that we just appreciated the most out of being published? Um, if there's anything that springs to mind, I guess I guess some of them you kind of expect. So you kind of expect to really love seeing your, your book on a shelf in a bookshop. You walk in and you see it there. That's a really lovely feeling. But I, I guess the one that was surprising was when when a reader has read it a reader you don't know so it's you're not related to this reader reader you haven't <laughs> handed it them and say read this of uh, someone completely unrelated has read your book and goes oh, i just really love it i like this character and they're so, they're almost more into it than you are and i thought that that's the thing that's really stuck with me that when there's a young reader it's not an adult friend it's a, a young reader's found your book and go i just love it it just really i really connected with it and i thought i was thinking about my best thing and I think that's been the best thing um, yeah I remember when I think one of my first Amazon reviews was my stepmom <laughs> kind of disclaimer at the beginning saying I know you probably think I'm biased as I am <laughs> the, the, the author's stepmother but this is a brilliant book and she wrote this beautiful beautiful uh, review and I was like that's amazing but you know me is anyone else <laughs> gonna, uh, anyone else that doesn't know me gonna write nice stuff and they and they did um and it is just the luscious luscious feeling isn't it it's mm. yeah 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 i think having yeah the people who have no they they've got no external connection to you having that kind of reaction and i think the thing i didn't expect was perhaps seeing um, in schools or librarians seeing them take your book and then I've seen people make like beautiful displays or engage with it in a way that I wouldn't think of and that's that's magic it's it's yeah like, like you know, its own author shrines or like, <laughs> like, I'm gonna feel to being like Lady Gaga I think is having those kind of like author shrines in the library and they've got yeah like facts about your book and pictures of you and yeah it's really nice yeah, or when they've memori memorised all the information from the bio on your website. <laughs> I'm like, oh yes, this is great. Yeah, that's getting into stalker territory. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think another really nice thing, I think it's just the children's writing community as well. Um, I come from a, an acting background, which is kind of supportive in some ways, but it's a much more kind of competitive sort of cutthroat thing you know and you go into an audition and you and you know that you're there to kind of compete for this one role and there might be you know you might be in a room full of six foot beautiful models and it just feels a bit a bit less supportive um and i guess one of the things i didn't realize was kind of how supportive um the children's writing community is kind of like face to face and, and like through social media as well um, and I think through Golden Egg, especially like I've met met some brilliant writer buddies who I think some of them are, are watching now. So hello. Um, yeah. And just, yeah. And online as well. And it just and it feels a pretty supportive place to be. Yeah, I think I was really pleasantly surprised by that as well. Sort of even coming from my MA course where we were all 
it, I guess it's the same as the Golden Egg. We were all unpublished and working towards the same goal, but it, it felt like everyone's triumphs. People, people got around to them and were really excited for them as well. And that's a really, I think that's quite a special thing about an industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I think finding your tribe, whether it is Golden Egg or an MA or or just finding the people you, you debuted the same year with, or it's it's good to be able to share the good stuff and then the downsides because there are disappointments all around it as well. But you can't really air those as publicly because um, there's a phrase that I keep kind of coming back to. It's your diamond shoes are pinching that you're in a position of massive um privilege you've been chosen to be um published yeah. and it's a great time but to then complain about it it's not it's not a great thing so keeping those those conversations a little bit quieter when your books are coming out is it's it's really useful because there are downsides um that all that there's unexpected things that sort of catch you in a way and you thought oh i did i didn't know i wasn't expecting that coming um so i wonder whether should we should we talk about a few of those <laughs> 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 um that the sort of disappointments you thought oh, i i wasn't expecting that anyone got one that they want to share i think i hadn't thought about i think i'd always thought about the fact that once someone's published they're published and then i then all of the ideas they have will be brilliant and will go on to be published and i hadn't thought about the fact that the books you see are the ones that have been accepted and been successful and that there was still a lot of work to do in the meantime and that to get to the idea that is accepted you perhaps have to churn through quite a lot of others yeah. I, I haven't maybe thought that through yeah, yeah and i think i think also that like writing the book is actually just a tiny tiny part of the author job um and i think people just assume you're kind of sat there in your lovely kind of little writing shed like roll dull having kind of tea brought to you on tap writing away <laughs> um and and there is a little bit of that i haven't got the shed but i've got a nice desk but there's so much more as well that i i didn't kind of expect so whether it's kind of like writing blog posts when you've just been published um and writing quite a lot of stuff as well um which is often you know not paid which is fine but you know you have to kind of put time aside to, to do it um and then kind of you know doing events and um you know like recording author videos and and things like that and 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 yeah and it takes time doesn't it so i think it's yeah and, and all the kind of promotion social media stuff um so i think the writing bit is just a tiny bit of the job yeah, and they're trying to find that balance between saving enough time for writing, but also doing all of the promo or interaction that you need to do as well. Yeah, I, that's what I found. It was a surprising amount of hard work, actually, around, <laughs> around publication. Um, and very often it's that sort of time that you're expected to hand in your next draft of whatever's next. And it's all a bit, all a bit much. <laughs> I think that's probably what I found. It, and I, I also found that if I'm in promotion mode, which was not something that I'd ever got a skill set for. I was just at home writing. Um, that it's actually quite a nerve wracking thing and it, it requires an entirely different mindset. So to go from quietly introspectively writing to then be a kind of outgoing gregarious um, person to talk about your book, there in there, there's very little crossover with um, the skills that you need. So it was quite a steep learning curve and it's quite nerve wracking because putting your work out for other people to read is well, it's terrifying. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's it's sort of that nervous excitement of this could go either way. Who knows? Yay! <laughs> and also um, the, the like, like allowing like yourself to give you know to give yourself a bit of a pat on the back and to say and to say oh I'm I'm doing this or I'm doing that without you know coming across as a bit of an oh I'm not going to swear but a bit of a, <laughs> a bit yeah. of an arrow person who's just kind of yeah. completely you know just talking about yeah. themselves and their achievements all the time but you know you've got to celebrate everything haven't you yeah 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 I think and I found um yeah finding how to be myself on social media and how how I wanted to be the, the like the author on social media in the same way as I found events finding my way of doing an event that that took quite a lot of more work than I thought it would there's quite a lot of soul searching actually because you you kind of thinking what kind what 
part of my personality? Am I willing to share what what what's going to appeal to children, um, your, your, or to your audience, young people? Um, it's it's there's a lot of well, it, but also I I found that having um, my goal of being published. Once you are published, then you're a little bit like, oh well, now what's the point of my existence? Uh, what am I aiming for? <laughs> and so there's yeah. you, there's a lot of um, yeah, sort of reevaluating where you are and where you're going and what you really want in life and all of that. So that's I I personally found that quite a lot um, when I first yeah I, I, anticlimactic. I kind of thought after yeah. the like. The, to speak kind of truthfully after being published and the joy of having a like a lovely launch and I think that was in part because we went into lockdown quite quickly but there was a bit of a oh uh, what well, okay I've been working so hard on this for so long like what yeah to keep that momentum going isn't it and well I think it for me that sort of comes back to the whole thing about I find publishing is such a long process so you're really you're excited you're excited that someone's interested and then um, it's um, incredible when they say they want the book but then between that and finishing the book is a long period of time but then there's another period before it comes out and then but you you can't be excited for that long <laughs> it's <incredible. Yeah. laughs> and so you get that little boost at publication but then it's you don't get the same feedback for quite a while I think yeah and, and it, the industry is so it's so it moves at kind of glacial pace doesn't it uh, well for quite a lot of the time and then things happen really really quickly yeah. <laughs> which i didn't kind of anticipate and um yeah it's it's, it's a lot of kind of wait like waiting mm. yeah and trying to i think the thing i've been working on a lot is trying to have other things to do so that i'm not waiting is to be excited about the next thing or have something else slightly different that i'm itching to dive into because it does just feel like endless waiting sometimes <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was, um, pre-publication, there was a lot of waiting. So I was sort of thinking, well, perhaps after I've got a book out, the waiting would stop and, and it, it, it isn't, you're just waiting for different things, uh, which is fine. But having, so, so the same advice to be working on the next project while you're waiting to hear back from an agent or being working on your next project while you're waiting to hear back from an editor, it's the same. It's still the same rule. <laughs> have something else, you know, that you're working on or have, um, I've, you try and have a fun project and then a serious project. You have different projects for different moods or you just, yeah, because I, also I think if you're moving from writing as a hobby to writing as a profession, that's also a, um, a tricky change because even the people around you, well, I, I started out writing as a hobby and then I took it more seriously. And, um, and so my family and my friends were thinking this was my hobby and then I'm now doing it at a job and so it's it's a change for everyone and um, we're taking this ever so seriously for a hobby I'm like no 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 this has yeah. changed now <laughs> and and that's a shift just for everybody but I think you have to take it seriously yourself and then everybody else gets the message you can't yeah especially if you're you have else. other jobs as mm. well do you guys do other jobs or are you working do you write full-time full time um well i'm juggling um parenting and retaking lodgers but yes it's it's sort of in between but yeah i don't have another paid job um but i think if you're trying to juggle something else it is it's carving out the time or yeah. making making the time for it carving out the time without burning out as well i think yeah king sure because rest rest is work a lot of the time i find so, yeah yeah i'm gonna need to go for that walk yeah and allowing yourself to switch off as well isn't it and allowing that kind of breathing time I think and because so much of writing is about kind of self motivation and kind of carving out the time like there is a real tendency to kind of yeah like feel guilty for not taking every moment to write down you know yeah. scribble stuff down and I think having that time to for yourself is so important mm. just to be a sloth <laughs> Yeah. yeah there's got to be a movie night every now and again <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah. guys my ipad is on its last legs i'm just gonna plug it in okay oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's some really cool comments down the side i keep getting sidetracked by all the lovely comments <laughs> hi vicky oh, your mic's off vicky yep hang on is that better no, that can you hear me yeah, yeah yep just just while we're doing a, a five second break while holly um i'm back you're back? 
yeah. jolly good because Sorry. um no 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 i just want to say ladies we are getting a ton of questions coming in so i might just ask a few let you work through those and then drop back off again because i have to tell you you got more more questions than barry had on the previous session so <laughs> if it's a competition you're winning <laughs> okay okay so the top question so far with 27 votes um, originally came from Colin, Colin Baxter. Thank you, Colin. If you were a debut author now, knowing what you do, what would be your best golden bit of advice? Oh, oh one of them, and it's a really boring one, is kind of like, like learn about the ins and outs of the contracts. <laughs> um, like I'm really unorganized. I'm not very kind of business minded. So I had no idea about the kind of jargon and the terms of your contract. And, and luckily I've got, you know, my lovely agent, uh, Kate, who's super business savvy. So she kind of really, really went through it, but yeah, possibly just to kind of get to grips with that kind of stuff about advances and escal escalators. Is that one of them? And, um, percent you know percentages and kind of rights and all that kind of stuff i think it would have been good to kind of swat up a little bit to begin with Great. i think for me the, the probably the most daunting thing was do, the prospect of doing events and working with children just because i'd never done it before and i wish i had not been quite so scared and done more research ahead of time i think because it, it would have it would have made everything a lot easier in the beginning and asked more advice from other authors as to what they do um i think that would have been the main thing so if that prep if you're thinking about what's going to happen when your book's published and what you don't know about and ask asking questions yeah that's a good one asking plenty of questions <laughs> yeah, ask loads. um i think Mine was, I set off because mine was summer of no regrets. I decided to say yes to every opportunity that came along. And I wonder whether with hindsight, I might have said no to a couple of them. Um, and also be a little bit aware that there are cheeky people out there who will ask things without very much um, come back for you. So I, I think just being slightly aware that sometimes if, if you think, oh, that's quite a big ask, to say no to it or to say, is there a fee? <laughs> and just having that as a, just as an open-ended question back. So I think um, that was just, yeah, I think I will be, that's what I would do a little bit more of next time. Or oh, no, not next time, if I ever did it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that is great. Um, what was the most challenging or unexpected thing that's happened during your publishing experience? Morag, do you want to start with this one? Oh. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's from Kim. The most challenging thing. I would say that generally, generally children's book people are lovely and the reviews are really nice, but there are always people who don't like what you've, you've written or what you've made and have opinions about it. And I think I find that the most challenging, actually. It's to it's like it's like always the negative things really stay with you and making having processes in place so that you see see the big amount of lovely things that people have said rather than remembering that tiny negative thing that's been the biggest challenge that's really helpful being able to put them in proportion yeah, yeah. Um, I think my biggest challenge was I'd assumed once it was published, it would then be in every bookshop. Um, and I think realising that there's no guarantee that you'll be in any bookshop or in Waterstones or anywhere you go. So I did spend quite a lot of time going from bookshop to bookshop going, hi, I'm an author. You probably haven't heard of me. Here's my book. And so I did a lot of that. Um, but I wasn't expecting that. And that it's not... Well, it was, it was disappointing, but then you kind of have to sort of turn it around um, and then do something about it. But that was, I think that was the thing I hadn't realised might happen, that it might, it really doesn't guarantee you're in a bookshop. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, kind of following on from that, just the importance of not comparing your your journey to anyone else's. I hate that word, journey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, um, 
yeah, you know, you just cut everyone's doing such different things and each kind of genre of writing kind of offers different kind of paths and uh, I don't know, people are looking for different things at different times. And so just to kind of, I think, bear that in mind, just kind of, yeah, just to think it, just to think about what you're doing, you know, and yeah, you might not get the results you want with this book, but just, you know, onwards, isn't it really? And just to kind of, yeah, you can't compare yourself to, to anyone else really. And there's no point. It's just, it's just, po it's just pointless to do that. Okay, um, we are getting reports of some echoes. I'm not sure if it's me, um, but maybe when you're not speaking, if you can just pop your microphone on, on mute, it's the little microphone icon that you will find just above your head when you're talking. Um, okay, well, we're up to, we've still got loads of questions coming in. Um, this one's for you, Holly. Um, oh. Interested, your initial Twitter pitch for Demelza. Could you give more details? Oh, yeah. So it was um, a Twitter pitch competition. And uh, yeah, you just have to literally pitch your book in a tweet. Um, and there's loads of them um, on Twitter, loads of different um, sort of writing courses do them. I think there's one just for kind of scary books. And there's one just for YA. So there's loads of them. So just have a look at the hashtags. Um, and yeah, just kind of tweeted the pitch. And then I think they did a long list and a short list. Um, and I, I didn't win in the end. I don't think I even placed anywhere, but one of the judges was an agent. Um, and yeah, she liked the sound of Demelza. So um, she asked um, that when it was, when I'd finished a kind of draft to, to send it over. Um, yeah, and it kind of went from, from there really. So those kind of things are great. I think I'd probably recommend not doing too many of them because I think you can kind of get bogged down maybe with just kind of entering everything. So, yeah, maybe kind of pick one or two just to kind of um, to enter. And it's a really good skill as well just to be able to um, um, do kind of a really, really sh uh, short, snappy um, pitch. And if you can kind of get your book idea down to 140 characters, I think that's just a really good exercise in itself as well for pitching. Okay, that's great. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Very helpful. Um, back to the questions. Does it financially support you or do you all have other jobs? Morag, do you want to start with this one? Um, I think um, it's my only job. So it, it does at the moment. I think um, being an illustrator really helps with that. Um, with a picture book, it means that often your royalties are divided in half. Um, whereas I, I have all of those and I've been working with two hoots for a few years now and they've been really supportive. So at one point I was putting out two books a year, which whilst being a big workload really definitely helped financially. And also with picture books, I think there's such an emphasis on trying to get things that are suitable for international co-edition, which I didn't really understand the true importance of in terms of picture book, but I see I, I see that in my income. That's the thing that makes the biggest difference for me. Um, but also it's been a slow build. This, this year has been different because usually I do a lot of events and that's, a, that's quite a significant source of income for me. Usually in Scotland, we have br the brilliant Scottish Book Trust fund a lot of events going into schools and I usually do a lot of work with them. Um, so it means I kind of do things from all different areas so it's it's books but it's the things round about that um as well as my illustrations and artwork so it's not it's not purely just books that fund me okay hi um so i don't have another job um i've got four kids and we take in lodgers as a way of income um and but i if i didn't have the support from my husband then i don't it, I wouldn't be earning enough to support myself. Um, but then again, I sort of look at it as starting your own business and most businesses don't make um, money within the first, I don't know, two or three years. So I'm kind of trying to find ways of building it up from there. Um, 
like Orag said, school visits and events are a really big part of your income. I read, so I've just done my tax returns. And so I'm like, oh, right, okay, this is really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it's sort of the faxy, figures e type um, side of things. And I realized that although I didn't do loads of events in the last tax year, which was around my first book, um, the events I did outstripped the money that I had earned from selling the book, um, which was an interesting thing to learn. I know Alexandra Shepherd did a blog about it and where she talked about percentages. So the percentage of her income based on what where, on her events and on her advance and um, and the, the commission, the oh, what's it, royalties. Um, and and the percentage was more based around um, doing events. So I think as a writer, you look for other income streams, even whether, whether it's within writing. So I'm taking on some IP um, work as well so that it won't dilute what I'm doing with my my main books but it brings in another income stream because I think it's it's really hard and until you've got a, a few books and then you've got lots of bits of money coming in from each of the books and then as you get more established then more of your backlist sells so there's there's all of that so I think when you start out it's it's quite tricky especially when bookshops are shut and schools are, um, well, not even last term, they weren't doing very many in-person events. And now when they're you know, sort of mainly online learning, it's very much more tricky to find, um, find events to do. So it's a challenge, I think. Holly, anything you want to add? Um, so yeah, I before lockdown, I work part time in Otty and the Bee, which is a children's bookshop down in uh, South East London. Um, but that's closed at the moment. Um, so hopefully I'll get to go back there at some point. Um, and then I do drama classes as well for children. Um, I don't act anymore. But yeah, I do kind of private classes and Saturday morning classes for kids, which um, I do online now, which is really weird. Um, doing drama online is, yeah, they're not kind of the best of bed fellows. Um, so yeah, I'm just, yeah, kind of doing bits and bits and bobs of other things. Um, and, you know, as awful as lockdown has been, it, you know, it's given you, the, me anyway, the luxury of time to kind of, yeah, do like a draft of the, you know, my second book and start editing it now, so you know, kind of silver linings and all that. Um, yeah, I'd love to be able, I'd love to be able to write kind of as my as my main earner, um, but I, I've kind of always got ants in my pants. So I'll always want to do other little bits and pieces as well. I think I'm not the kind of doing the one job for life kind of girl. And, and I think what you've all made very clear is um, it's work. There's a lot of work that goes on with it, you know, the, the marketing, the, um, the school visits, the things like that. And, you know, you, you have, it, this is your, this is a job. You have to work at it. And, um, and unfortunately we're not all, you know, even though you're all successful authors, you're not sitting back in your mansions, just watching the royalty checks <laughs> roll in, <laughs> although you deserve to be. Okay. Next question. Um, when you got a yes from your agent, had your manuscript already been professionally edited? That's from Amanda. Um, shall I go? As I forgot to press mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. I I um, worked with Charlotte Maslin from the Golden Egg Academy, who's just a Wonder Woman. Um, so yeah, when I was doing the Golden Egg um, Foundation year, um, I worked with her on Demelza, um, and she really helped me to kind of hone my craft and really get to the heart of the story. I think. Um, and so, yeah, I worked, worked on it really, really hard with her um, and then did a bit of tinkering then before I, um, yeah, started querying. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd done kind of journalism stuff um, and video journalism before doing Golden Egg, but I'd never written any fiction um, or any children's fiction. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really I didn't really have much of a clue what I was doing. So yeah, working with someone who's going to kind of give you those one-to-one -one sessions um, was just completely invaluable. Um, and yeah, forever grateful to my buddy, Charlotte Maslin. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I hadn't been professionally edited as such, but my books, the initial books that I was taking to an agent all came out of um, my MA course. So I'd, I'd worked on them with a lot of other people, I guess, but in the same way as a critique group would, I would say. Although there were those lecturers involved, I think actually the feedback and speaking to, showing it to all of the people who were really passionate about picture books was probably what made them, made them have like come together into something cohesive. Um, yeah, I I hadn't I don't think I'd paid anyone to look at it. I think I went along to the Scooby Quick Groups um, in Birmingham, so the S C B W I um, Quick Groups in Birmingham, and taken a chapter along for a, a while. And everybody, um, like Morag said, other people who are passionate about children's literature <laughs> sort of looked at it, and went, oh. <laughs> or oh, this bit's good, uh, and 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 then it's the process of looking at theirs as well and critiquing because it's very much easier to spot what's wrong in somebody else's piece than your own um and so just that whole process of just um sort of fine tuning was really really helpful so um not a paid editor but definitely um lots of critiquing and then from that i've got one or two friends um who are excellent excellent um critiquers who are now my go-to people like is this chapter working? Would you mind in the next week, perhaps having a little read? And that's absolutely invaluable because, and then you do the same for them. And and so it's a reciprocal arrangement and that's really, really, it's really useful um, because um, you kind of expect the imposter syndrome to leave, but it doesn't. Um, it, it slowly edges towards the door and then it comes back again. So having someone go, no, no, this is okay. This is all right. You've not completely forgotten how to string words together. It's fine, is, is really helpful. So I think yeah, I had it. Um, strongly critiqued. <laughs> that's that's really really good to know because um, I I as long along with many others suffer from imposter syndrome all the time. Um, so now, when you got your first book deal, um, did your agent or publisher ask you what's the next book? Did you did you have to have that ready, or were they just was it all about the books that you were going in with? Morag, why don't you start? Okay. Um, I guess picture books are probably a little bit different in that I think it's quite unusual for an agent to take you on on the strength of one picture book. They probably want to see, see a better sense of how you work overall. So I don't think, I didn't really go in with one book as being the book that we were pitching more a kind of a sort of small portfolio of two or three ideas kind of worked up to different standards I would say but I imagine that would be very different if you're talking about something a lot longer perhaps if it was a I've been my agent I've been trying to work on something a bit longer and with that then we have the idea and I don't I only need the one book written but I they're, they're very keen for me to have developed a sense of what the next book might look like like so that there's a synopsis there. Holly? Um, yeah, so I signed a three book deal at the beginning um, and I've got loads of interesting things to say, but I don't come allowed to <laughs> um, at the moment um, because the second book hasn't been kind of announced yet officially. Um, so I'm going to have to say that horrible thing of watch this space. Um, but yeah, it, it, um, what I thought I was going to write is going to be different to what I had originally, what the, the, than what, than what we'd originally discussed. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, uh, yeah, I can say that. <laughs> okay. We'll let you off the hook. <laughs> Kate, how about you? What was your experience? Um, my experience was, um, I've been. It, they've both been one book deals um so there was no expectation of anything else um there was hope um from uh, firefly were always very well let's hear what you want to write next let's hear more ideas um and and there was another idea in the pipeline that i then hurriedly developed a little bit more to say and then but there was actually I, i'm kind of remembering 
I had ideas and then I went back to them and they went, oh, have you thought about doing this? And then we kind of went backwards and forwards with ideas before they went, oh, yes, we like this one. And then we signed another book deal. So um, so it was it, it. I don't see it as rejection, but it was more of a conversation to get the best book for the second book. Um, so it wasn't something that was fixed at all because I'm quite a make it up as I go along um, writer and um, I'm trying to be more of a plotter. But um, but it, it turned out to be a better book because of their input early on. And they said, well, you could take it in this direction or have you thought about this? And they weren't pushy at all, which was lovely. But there definitely was some steering, which I was really grateful of to make it a better book. So uh, it was more of a collaborative process for the second book rather than me having written it. And we did very little editing, really, for the first one. The second one was much more collaborative, which which was really that really nice experience, actually. OK, now we've got a question from David and uh, I like this one. Did you ever panic that someone, <coughs> excuse me, that somebody else was going to publish your story before, you know, your story idea before you did? Did you go like like I've done and I'm sure, you know, others have done? Did you go searching on Amazon to see if there was something there? <laughs> Just, yeah. Uh, Kate, we'll start with you this time. Um. <sighs> There was a little bit of a worry, um, but not nothing uh, that wasn't one of my top five worries. Um, I, I, I was worried about other things rather than that one. So that wasn't one of my worries, unfortunately. And I think even if even if there is another book that's got a very similar sort of pitch to it, the way it's written will always be massively different. So I think even if you do find a book that feels frighteningly, frighteningly similar, um, the way they way the way they've been um, produced or written will be so different that it'll be okay. But I, that wasn't a worry I had, fortunately. I might now. I might now have it. <laughs> uh, I always am searching titles on Amazon to check <laughs> and see if something already exists. And I've. I don't think I'm scared that someone will have the same book as me, but I think books can appear a little bit similar, perhaps. And I've definitely, I've changed titles of books that I was going to submit when suddenly a new book is announced. And although they're actually about something quite different, if the title is the same, or then, or, or sometimes I've put it in my back pocket for another year or so until that one's died down. Because it's not that someone's taken your, that you've got exactly the same idea or that you're actually going to compete. It's just that, that appearance of competition. But I think... Like you, like you were saying, if your book's never going to be the same thing, and you're always, even if you're always going to be able to tweak something about how it's presented to make that clear to people. Yeah, de definitely. I remember when I was um, doing my Golden Egg Foundation year, um, and I'd come across a book online that I thought was exactly the same as mine, and. I needed to start again from scratch and I was really, really stressed and yeah, super upset. And so I remember emailing Emma um, that used to work for Golden Egg and saying, I found this book, what am I going to do? And she said, OK, I'll have a look, look at it. And she came back and she was like, you know, there's there's a couple of things. Yeah, there's you know, there's an inventor girl and there's some haunted stuff going on. But it's so, so completely different. Her style is different. She's American. The characters are completely different. And so don't even worry about it. And and she said, you know, this came out with a really, really, really small press somewhere in America. So it hasn't had lots of publicity. And so just carry on writing. So, yeah, I think I kind of panicked a bit for nothing. And as Morag said, you know, like you can have, there can be very similar elements, but only you can write your stories and your voice is going to be completely different to, you know, to anyone else's. Um and I think, well, actually, with the book, I'm the second book I'm writing at the moment. Um, when I got feedback from my um, editor, um, editors, um, and they said that you know the the bulk of the book is is great and it's unique, but actually, you need to set not set it somewhere else, but the protagonists need to have a different background and they need to come from somewhere different um, because a lot of books had been published recently um, where the characters had kind of lived in this. A certain place let's say um and so even though the kind of bulk of the story is different i've needed to kind of go back and bookend it in a different way now so the characters are kind of 
have a different background and a different experience just to make it to kind of make it stand out, I guess. That's fantastic. Okay, another question. Uh, and um, this is from my uh, colleague on the social club in the background, Elizabeth. Uh, what were your expectations of getting an agent and what happened after that versus what actually happened when you got an agent and what happened after that? Kate, you grinned. We'll start with you. Um, so I I think I, I signed with my agent relatively quickly. So it was a couple of years after I started writing, I signed with my agent. Um, and I then expected everything immediately to happen um, without, a, without a hitch. <laughs> she just would bounce it straight on. <laughs> um, that didn't happen. So we did lots of editing, which I was fine with. And we sent it out. It didn't get anywhere. We wrote another. We did lots of editing. We sent it out. It, it got, you know, we got to acquisitions repeatedly, but I wrote a lot. And actually the two years before I signed with my agent and then it was four years with my agent before I signed the deal so that was not what I was expecting on the flip side I in that four years I learned a great deal about my expectations and um, what was likely to happen so actually I didn't have a lot of surprises once my book came out um, because I had been surprised quite a lot within that four years and of watching intensely what was happening with other people and saying oh yes so yes you do get some really massive deals and things do happen really quickly for some people but actually it's much slower for the vast majority of people it's just you hear about the others because it's unusual um and so and so actually um i i had most of my surprises in those four years and then when i published it was sort of i'd already got into a framework of okay there's ups there's downs this is fine i'm going to carry on regardless because I had carried on regardless. Um, but yeah, that, that was my experience. <laughs> Morag, do you want to go next? Um, so I think in some ways I had a slightly opposite experience in that things went really, really, I signed with an agent after my MA and things went really, really, really fast for the first little while. And then I got even more expectations as to that things would go at that pace and we'd be in touch that much and there'd be things going on all the time and actually there was just a bit of a buzz around me having graduated from this MA show and it was very much a place where publishers and agents are looking for looking for things and that it sort of slowed down quite a lot but I think for me that was really beneficial I'd signed with an agent who used to be an editor and so I got to really work on my writing for a long time um, but I think probably the biggest surprise for me was that then I I, th I thought I'd signed with my agent for life and then she decided that she wanted to go back and be an editor again so she wasn't going to be an agent anymore um, and so I'm still with the same agency and I'm working with a different agent um, which at the time I, I was I was a bit bereft that she had she'd left me um, but in lots of ways it's been really good he's he's a very different kind of agent and it's worked out well for where I am at with my writing as well because I've been working with to Hoots, the publisher, for so long, I kind of need their editorial input more than I need his at the moment. And he's brilliant on all the business side and the contracts and the things that really stress me out and I don't know anything about. Um, but that's also been really beneficial, I think, that I've seen two different, very different ways of agenting um, and can have got, I feel like I've worked, it's worked out pretty well for me and that I've got the bits that I needed at the times that I've needed them. Um, yeah, I was quite pleasantly surprised with the with my kind of querying process. Um, and I think because I'd just been told and kind of rightly, rightly so that it's such a kind of long process and, you know, you're going to have so, so many re rejections. Um, and so I think I, I'd made a big kind of spreadsheet. It was the one time that I've kind of been quite organized and I made a spreadsheet of um, I went through the writers, um, what's it called? Writers and Artists Handbook. Is that right? Um, which is everyone should just invest in that. It's great. It's just full of everything you need to know. And so I just 
yeah made this spreadsheet um and put kind of like put all the agents that i wanted to query in and what they needed for submission and whether they wanted it sent by the through post or via email and how long they say that the waiting process is going to be and all of that kind of stuff and so i started and i just thought i was going to be doing this for you know kind of at least a year and i wrote to my first 11 um and got seven full requests and then got five agent offers so i was super lucky and yeah just it was more than i'd ever 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 dreamed of and and it was a really nice process i got yeah i got to go and have coffee and cake with lovely agents and yeah talk about writing and and i really really i really really enjoyed it and it was i and i think it, if you can go and meet with um agents and have a chat um it's great and they were all amazing and i wouldn't have written to them if if i wouldn't have been happy to kind of be represented by them but i think you just kind of have to go with your gut really and yeah i just really felt like i clicked with with kate Shaw and um i think yeah we had really similar kind of ideas for my book and i just felt like she really really got it um and i just yeah i just kind of knew in my gut that this was because you're going to be spending loads of time with this person and it's you know you're gonna be having hopefully like a really long relationship with them and so you want to have someone who you kind of trust and, and and feel like um you know has has your back and yeah someone you can like that you like as well you know you're gonna to, you know you want to be able to have chat have a chat with these people and kind of go for coffee and you know i've shared amazing amazing phone calls with kate and i've been on the you know phone in tears to her as well you know um so you need i think yeah like when picking a, an agent you need to kind of pick someone that you're gonna yeah want to spend a lot of time with right i hate to say it ladies and everybody in the audience but we are almost out of time um so i've had a quick scan through the questions and i think we've got time for one more one more which is really around i think the marketing now kate you mentioned early on that the marketing was a bit of a surprise for you about how much you had to do so maybe how did you adjust to the need to do so much marketing yourself and particularly in terms of your social media presence what did you have to do to kind of create your social media presence given the the world that we're in now i don't need the tiktok accounts but if you've got one that's great <laughs> um who would like to start kate you can start um i already was um on twitter quite a lot anyway um and i think it was just having having the awareness that you needed to talk about your book but not actually sell your book so um it was it 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 sort of um was sort of how it was fitting into your life and the surprising things you were finding and the nice things that came along because actually people do want to celebrate things as they as they happen to you as just like you want to celebrate their successes you want to hear about the good things that are happening to people um so it was having the confidence to say oh look i've just had the first copy through and this is the first time i've smelt my book um something like that and just it's finding those um those good moments to share but not that not being the only thing you talk about um i've i kind of edged into instagram and i've kind of facebook's a bit of a mm, um every now and again i pop things on facebook but facebook is not my happy place um i'm banned from having tiktok by my kids so i do not have a tiktok account they say i'm not allowed so that's that's fine i'm not particularly wanting one but that's my excuse um i think finding the time to juggle things once again, like we've we've already touched on is time management. So it's saying, OK, so you it's 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 allowing time within your day to say, right, the next half an hour, I'm going to be on Twitter. I'm going to be answering questions. I'm going to be sorting out all my messages and catching up. And then which is something I'm not very good at is then putting your phone down and walking away and having a break from it because you don't ha actually have to be on call to it all the time. I think that's the biggest thing. Although I was pretty much the two weeks around publication because it's that's a different thing, but you don't have to do that all the time. So I guess it's finding the balance for you. Um, but remembering it's not the only thing that there is to do. There's other things as well. So it's important, but not all important. <laughs> 
think I spent quite a lot of time kind of lurking on social media to see other authors and illustrators and to see what different how different people were using it and the things that I liked and the things that made me go oh that's that's a little bit much um I've never I've never got very good at using Twitter it doesn't work for me that well and I think that's one of the best pieces of advice I saw was find that if there's one social media thing that works for you use that one really well and don't worry about the others so I think especially because I'm quite visual I've I've really enjoyed Instagram um and through that it means I can sort of do Facebook as well because I just set it up to post automatically um and I think that's really connected me with a lot of illustrators but probably more so than the writing side of things I think it's it's quite interesting to see find out where your audience is as well because I think Facebook's probably quite important for me because it's the parents of three to five year olds that I want to be seeing my stuff mainly and they're mainly on Facebook um whereas um I think I find that there's a lot of writers on Twitter and there's a brilliant writing community there and those are people who buy your books as well and on Instagram it's there's a kind of a mix of parents and illustrators and that's that's where I feel the most comfortable so that's what I've been using I think you need to feel comfortable because people can people can tell if you're not enjoying it find your way of doing it yeah Twitter is the main one I use and I've just seen someone wrote in the um the comments it's a really good place for kind of um meeting with kind of like the gatekeepers so yeah the kind of adults who are going to be buying as Moro said you know your books because as much as you want to be engaging with children it's this it's the adults who are buying your books at the end of the day um most of the time yeah and also on twitter lots of brilliant um teachers as well um edgy hashtag edgy twitter um which can be a bit intense sometimes so i look at it from afar but loads of really good stuff um and um book bloggers who are also teachers like the reader teachers super super supportive and the family bookworms as well from wales there's some really really good kind of cheerleaders um and i think just yeah i use instagram a, a, um, a bit but i mainly just kind of copy and paste the stuff i write onto twitter onto instagram i'm a little bit lazy with it and i think it's just about being a, kind of honest as well really like you know the beautiful flat lays of the books with the mugs of hot chocolate and the fairy lights and the flower petals you know beautiful that's fine you know but that's it's not real is it you can't read a book if it's got a load of fairy lights on top of it so like they are be like they're beautiful but that's yeah that's not me and i just don't think you need to feel pressured to kind of be doing these kind of beautiful posts all the time um because i think people are interested in you know the real you as a as a as an author um yeah i yeah that's what that's what i would say <laughs> okay um ladies this has been the most informative refreshing insightful chat um we have i have really enjoyed it i've loved hosting you in this in this room um i think the comments on the side reflect the same thing everyone has really really enjoyed the chat um i hate to say it we are out of time now um, so everyone, if you could once again, thank our wonderful guests for me and please, as we wrap up, please consider making, um, or visiting the seven stories page, have a look, see what they're up to. And if you can make a donation to help them out, wishing you all the very, very best thank with your you. current and future projects. And, um, we shall watch the space, Holly and, um, <laughs> Happy writing, happy reading, everybody. And I'll say Thank thanks you. very much. Thanks and we'll so end much. now. Thank you. Bye. 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 How do we leave? I'll end the broadcast now. <laughs> <laughs>